while we're waiting, um, go ahead and put what your favorite marine animal is. So it can be an animal you find in the water. Um, we could do birds you find on the coast. You know, it could be like pelicans if you like those or crabs or anything you would find on the beach or in the water. Eels or crabs, that's cool. Ooh, manatees. I love manatees. I've swam with a few whenever I lived in Puerto Rico and they just, they're so peaceful. They'll just swim up to your boat and they'll just mind their own business. You know, they're really peaceful creatures. A platypus, interesting. I've never actually seen a real platypus i've always seen them on like tv or like on pictures or stuff like that so i've never actually seen a live platypus snow crabs those are delicious seahorse sea lions and octopus oh those are all really interesting i like those I really like octopuses. I wish I could like own one, but they're, I heard they're super hard to keep alive and maintain. Sea lions are also one of my favorites. I like seals, sea lions, that family. Coral, okay, so that might be my favorite answer because coral is actually one of the best sea creatures out there and they're kind of dying away. So it's kind of sad. You know, a few years from now, we might not have any coral in the ocean, which is kind of sad to think about. Sea snakes. Oh, okay. So I'm not a fan of those. <clears throat> I, uh, I do like snakes, but I don't like wild snakes, if you get what I'm saying. Like, my friends have snakes, and I do like handling them, and they're really fun um, to interact with, but wild snakes is a different story because they are not really fond of humans they're kind of scared of us so oh you speak spanish that's cool your dad's from puerto rico i'm from puerto rico too both my parents are i was born and raised there okay so we're gonna get started today um my name is riley i see the majority of you guys have been at previous lessons. So it's awesome to see you guys again. Um, again, I'm one of the marine educators at the MEC. And with me today, I have Lacey, who she's gonna be helping me out, making sure that I don't mess up and making sure everything goes smoothly. Yeah, so I'm an educator as well. Uh, me and Riley have worked together for almost a year now. Um, and I'll be behind the scenes, so you won't be able to see my face, but every now and then you might hear my voice, so. Cool. So uh, today we're going to be learning about plant identification. So we're going to talk about leaves, we're going to talk about trees and other organisms like that. Um, so today I actually am doing my presentation outside. So this is my backyard. So there's my dogs and stuff. There's one of my dogs, my other dogs back there. They like to hang out in my yard. So I figured, you know, better way to talk about trees would be to do it outside. Um, I have a few trees out here. I have a lemon lime, uh, lemon tree, a lime tree. I have a fig tree. Um, I just planted an avocado tree. We have some blueberry bushes, some azaleas, pink and purple. Um, and we have a pecan tree, so. Um, I actually collected this pecan. It's really small. This was just pushed with um, with the wind yesterday that it was really, really windy or the day before that. Um, so they're not ready yet. They'll be ready in the fall. So yeah, we have lots of, I'm trying to plant trees that I can eat, <laughs> not just look at. So we have lots of trees back here. Okay, so let's see. Awesome, we'll get started now. 
So plant and tree identification. All right, so first of all, we're gonna go over a few definitions. Um, I know this isn't everyone's favorite part, but we are gonna go over a few definitions just so whenever I'm talking about um, these things, you guys will know exactly what I'm talking about. So first of all, we have tree. So trees are a large plant with thick woody trunks and branches. So examples of these would be magnolias, pine trees, oak trees. So those are ones that are really, really common in the South. Next thing we have are shrubs. So these are medium plants with slender woody stems and branches such as holly um, and wax myrtle. So these guys are gonna be, they're gonna be like a mini version of a tree. Next thing we have are herbs. These are small, medium plants with soft green stems and stalks. So uh, the examples of this would be ferns, grasses, um, if you think about the herbs you cook with, so cilantro, oregano, parsley, all those things that, um, that your parents like to cook with. And then we have vines, so slender plants that climb on other plants by twisting or tendrils, such as, such as muscadine, um, catbriar, passionflower, um, you typically see vines. I have some on my pecan tree. Don't know what species it is, but they're really cool to um, watch grow. They grow really, really fast. And they start from really small leaves and eventually just spread and grow all over the tree. And then the last one we're gonna talk about are epiphytes. So epiphytes are really interesting as well. They're basically air plants. They use other plants as substrate to grow from. So Spanish moss, and resurrection ferns. So these guys basically grow off of other trees. So now we're gonna talk about leaves. So we have simple leaves and compound leaves. Simple leaves are a lot easier to think of just because they're the, the most common type of leaf. Um, I have an example of a leaf right here. This is a magnolia. So we're gonna reference this one. So first of all, we have the tip. So the tip of the leaf right here, this is the whole leaf. So the tip would be all the way up here, kind of see it. Then we have the blade. So the blade itself is gonna be the whole thing. So this whole thing right here with a green, basically where the green uh, color of the leaf is. We have the margin. So that's basically, you can see it. It's just like brownish line going all the way around the leaf. Then we have the midrib. So the midrib is this long thing right here. Lateral vein. So off of the midrib, we're going to have these small little vein structures, not like human veins, but or kind of like human veins, but um, they don't have any, you know, blood or anything like that. They just um, absorb nutrients and spread water through the leaves. Then we have a petiole. Um, this is the leaf stalk. So this part right here. And the stipules. So the stipules, we don't have an example of that because that's typically going to be on the, uh, on the stem or on the branch itself. Um, growing on the sides of the petiole. So it'll be kind of growing out here. Kind of look like small little leaves almost, like if a leaf is trying to grow. Okay, so those are all the structures of a simple leaf. Okay. So the next one we're going to talk about is a compound leaf. So this one's a little bit more uh, complicated to understand if you don't know what I'm talking about. I don't have any examples of a compound leaf with me, so I'm gonna do the best I can to explain what it is. So, so to, even before we start, the best way to think about it is, if you look at my mouse over here, the best way to think about it is, if you imagine this being a whole leaf, but it's split into different segments. So it's split up into what we call leaflets. So imagine this being a whole leaf, just like this, 
but it's split up into individual leaflets or individual small little leaves. That's the best way to think about it. Um, we have the same type, types of structures. So we have the petiole right here. Um, we have um, rachis. Um, sorry if I mispronounced these words. Um, so yeah, if you guys have any questions about this, I can explain a little bit further. Not gonna get too much into that. So we can get started on our trees. So um, I've been learning about these trees for a while now. I am not from the South, so I've had to kind of like get my way around it. Um, I learned a lot at the MEC about different trees. Um, as well as just living in uh, the South. So I, I go to the nature trails all the time, um, especially with that, when I lived in South Alabama and um, you know, I would walk my wife and my wife would be like, oh yeah, that's an oak tree, that's a pine tree, et cetera, et cetera. So I've been learning my way around the Southern trees. So the first one we're gonna talk about is the Southern Magnolia. So these guys are awesome. Um, they're really, really common in the South. These guys have the state flower as well as they are the state tree. So it's really interesting. These guys are really, really popular in Mississippi. Um, an example of the flower would be over here on the right hand side. So they are really big white flowers, really pretty to look at. They smell really good. These guys have unique characteristics. So their leaves this is an example of one. This one's kind of dull. So when I got it last week, it was really, really green and it wasn't bent like this, but I want you guys to notice something. So you can see that it's kind of shiny, right? You can see the light reflecting off of this leaf. So the top part of the leaf is going to be really glossy, really shiny, but at the bottom side, it's going to be really, really dull. So you kind of see the difference, right? Really shiny on the top really dull on the bottom and kind of fuzzy on the bottom. So that's gonna be a common characteristic with all magnolias is that they're gonna have these types of leaves. So this leaf is pretty big, you know, compared to my head, it's almost the same size, um, at least like lengthwise. So really, really big leaves. And then another cool characteristic that these trees have is that they have basically what uh, the equivalent of a pine cone. So pine trees produce pine cones to spread their seed to make more pine trees. So magnolias have like a magnolia version of that or a magnolia cone, as I like to call it. Uh, this is a dried out magnolia cone. They're not in season right now. So this one's been laying on the ground for a couple months. So it's not as pretty as it usually is. Um, Whenever a magnolia tree produces these, they're gonna look like uh, green pine cones. They almost look like a mango, almost. Um, so they'll, they'll grow and grow and grow and grow. And then whenever the seeds are ready, so the seeds are red, you can see it in this diagram on the right. Whenever the seeds are ready, that green looking magnolia cone will start to turn a shade of red. So that's when, you're, that's when you know it's ready to pop. Um, and that's when they really look like a mango because they have that greenish reddish um, color. So that's when you know it's ready to pop. And then in the fall, that's when we usually see them, they'll pop and then they'll have lots of red berries or uh, seeds, lots of red seeds hanging off of them. They kind of look like red peanut M&Ms. So if you ever eaten peanut M&Ms, um, whenever you eat the red ones, just think about those magnolia seeds. Don't recommend eating them. I heard they taste really, really bad. So don't, don't try them at home. <laughs> Next thing I want to talk about is the Sweet Bay Magnolia. So the Sweet Bay Magnolia is also very popular in the South as well as all over the world. So these guys actually produce a leaf that we cook with. So if your parents have ever um, cooked red beans and rice or like 
um, jambalaya, or in lots of Hispanic foods, we like to cook with this leaf. It's called a bay leaf, bay leaf. So um, that's something that I didn't know. I grew up, you know, um, with this leaf in my food. My parents cook with it all the time, but I never actually knew that it was part of the magnolia family. So that's really awesome because I really like magnolia trees. So the roots were once used for bait to trap beavers. So I'm guessing they, since these leaves produce a certain flavor in your foods, I'm sure beavers were attracted to this scent or this flavor, and it would be used back in the day whenever they would hunt for beavers to make, you know, um, pelts and um, for food. You don't actually eat the leaf, so I do not recommend eating the leaf. It's uh, it's really weird tasting. It's almost bitter, but it does add an extra uh, spice to your meal. So if you ever see a leaf in your food, um, don't eat it. <laughs> it's just there for flavoring. Okay, awesome. So the next thing we're gonna talk about is our saw palmettos. So saw palmettos, these guys are abundant in the South. So you'll see them almost everywhere you go. And they grow really fast. They grow like a weed. You know, if we cut them down a few months later, they're gonna be just as big and um, growing just as fast. So really abundant. So I want you guys to notice that these look like pine trees. So they kind of look, I mean, I'm sorry, they look like palm trees. I'm sorry. They look like palm trees. Um, you know, like where coconuts grow out of, they look like that. So they're actually in the same family. Seminoles used fruits for urinary tract infections. So um, if you had a tough time using the bathroom, you know, this was before we could just go to the pharmacy and before we could ask um, the doctor for medicine or anything like that, we'd have to use herbal medicine or um, eat different types of fruits or different types of plants in order to get those health benefits. So um, our Native Americans would use the berries to help with their urinary issues. And then the leaves were also used for fiber and they these guys have a symbiotic relationship with our tortoise beetle, a symbiotic relationship. So I'm gonna talk about that. Um, so if you've never heard of a symbiotic relationship, um, that's basically when two organisms have a relationship. So it can be a positive relationship or it can be a negative relationship or it can be in the middle. So an example of a negative relationship would be a parasitic relationship. So if your dogs or cats or any pets have had ticks or fleas before, that is considered a parasitic relationship. So the, par um, the fleas or ticks are basically eating off your dog and harming your dog. So it's hurting your dog, but these fleas and ticks are having the time of their life. You know, they're being well fed and they're being properly nourished, but your dog is getting hurt or your pets are getting hurt at the same time. So that'd be an example of a negative relationship. A, uh, an example of a positive relationship would be what we have with our saw palmettos and our tortoise beetles. So with these guys, um, our tortoise beetle, first of all, looks like a black ladybug, exactly the same way. Um, I saw a few whenever I was collecting some saw palmetto leaves. And basically the saw palmetto provides a home for these tortoise beetles. And in return, the tortoise beetle kind of like makes sure that other organisms don't really bother these saw palmettos. So microorganisms, ants, or anything that's trying to harm this saw palmetto. Okay. So the next tree we're going to talk about is a yopon holly. That's how you pronounce it, yopon. Um, so this is an example of a female and male plant. 
So not all plants are come in a female and a male plant, but these guys do. These guys produce a red berry. So you can see it on the top left. It's a red berry, very abundant um, whenever they grow off of these. Um, holly bushes, have you heard of those? Those are the, those are the ones with um, really sharp leaves. You know, if you've ever fallen into a holly bush, it's no fun. You, you get up and you have scratches all over you. Um, they're really common in Christmas time. So a lot of people like to decorate their wreaths with holly, um, holly leaves and holly berries and all that. They are the only plant in North America to have natural caffeine in the leaves and twigs. So that's also really interesting. And then we have two examples of these holly, uh, these holly trees or holly shrubs. So they can be really, really small, just like these little bushes right here. But if you don't trim them and you just kind of like let them grow wild, they, they can grow really, really tall. Um, so this is another example on the bottom left of what these guys can look like if they just keep on growing and growing and growing. My parents have a 15, almost 20 foot holly uh, shrub at their house. And I mean, it reaches up to the second floor, which is kind of crazy. So that, that holly shrub had been there for a really, really, really long time and no one really tended to it. Hey, Lacey, um, which one is the first poll question that we have? The first one was which of these is not a plant? And then the next one after that was about Spanish moss. Okay, awesome. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Alrighty, so next thing we're going to talk about is a slash pine tree. So a slash pine tree is abundant in the south as well. These guys are super, super tall. Um, you can see in this image on the bottom right, if you're looking at a slash pine tree from the bottom, this is typically the image you're going to get. Um, so these guys will grow taller than the canopy. So they're going to grow taller than any other tree in the forest for two reasons. So they're really, really competitive. Um, so these guys are actually really smart. So they'll grow as fast as possible all the way up to the top of the canopy. So that way they're getting all the sunlight and all the nutrients from the sun. And that way um, they're not in the shade where all of the smaller trees or shrubs um, don't get enough sunlight. So these guys are getting all the food in the world. These guys produce pines. So this is an example of a pine cone, just like what we talked about with our magnolia cone. And that's where the seeds come out of. They're known as conifers. These guys are evergreen trees that have needles instead of leaves. So that's also a unique characteristic. These guys don't have big old leaves like this. They have really, really, really skinny leaves. and usually grow um, two to three needles on each little one of these uh, stems or petioles. Slash pine trees are also very resilient to fires. Um, if there's ever a forest fire, usually everything on the bottom, you know, where all the dead branches and dead twigs, leaves, and even smaller trees, that will be consumed by the fire. So it's gonna be burning up, getting really, really hot. Um, and these guys have an advantage. So these guys are a bit more resilient, which means that they can withstand fires a lot better than other trees. Um, you know, <clears throat> after fire, the bark on the outside will be really, really uh, burnt, but the inside hardwood of these slash pine trees will still be in good conditions. So our animals um, and insects, <clears throat> they know that these trees are really tall and resilient to fires. So whenever a forest fire is happening, they'll actually climb up these trees and <clears throat> wait out the fire. And whenever the fire is done with, they'll go back down and scavenge for food, scavenge for water and homes.
Next tree we have is a lob lolly pine tree. So our lob lolly pine trees are also fascinating. These guys are gonna be a lot shorter than our slash pine trees. So that's one characteristic that these guys um, don't have in common. So if you go back to the other slide, you can see that this tree is a lot taller. So the slash pine tree is a lot taller and our loblolly is a lot closer to the ground. But since it's closer to the ground, it spreads its branches wider. So that way it can absorb more energy from the sun because it doesn't have that advantage of being tall and being above the forest canopy. So it'll spread its branches so that way it can absorb and have more surface area for the sun. These guys also have pine cones. Um, they are all abundant in the south because we have lots of water in the south. So we have lots of rivers, streams, lakes. We have the ocean as well. So we've had these loblolly pine trees growing in the sand, which is crazy to think of. You don't really think of uh, pine trees growing in the sand, but we've seen both um, loblolly more commonly and we have seen slash pine trees. So loblolly is a rough rough translation for mud dwelling. So loblolly, think about that next time. So these guys like to live wherever the water is really abundant in the soil. So wherever, um, like I said before, anywhere there's a water source, we'll, site, we'll see these loblolly pine trees. They like that muddy water. They like that um, moisture in the water. Okay. So uh, next thing we have is a live oak tree. So um, these guys will be all over the south. You'll see them if you go downtown Ocean Springs. We're going to see lots and lots and lots of live oak trees all over the street. These guys are so um, respected in the south because they are respected that whenever they're building um, streets and roadways, they would actually build around these trees so that way they wouldn't have to cut them down because these guys can live up to a really, really long time. Um, an average of 300 years. Um, so that's crazy to think of that these guys can live 300 years. That's basically when the Declaration of Independence was signed in 1776, I hope that's right. Um, so they were baby babies whenever the Declaration of Independence was signed in the United States. And um, lots of Spanish moss like to live on these trees. So wherever you see a live oak tree, you're probably going to find some Spanish moss on it as well. And we'll talk about Spanish moss in a little bit. Um, Lacey, do I have a poll question for this one? Uh, how old the trees? Yes, you do. Do you want me to bring okay. it up right now? Yes, please. That'd be awesome. Thank you very much. I'm telling you, this presentation would not run as smooth if I didn't have Lacey as a moderator. So thank you, Lacey. So how old is the oldest live oak tree? You guys can guess. Um, it's okay if you don't know the answer. I didn't know the answer until I researched. So um, if you don't know the answer, it's okay. Just do your best guess. We're just waiting on one more, trying to get everybody to vote. Okay. All 
Awesome. So we had a few people say 300, 1,000, and 1,500. So the oldest live oak tree is in fact 1,500 years old. That is crazy. That is crazy to think of. 1,500 years old. That's, I mean, that's at least like 50 generations of people, um, of our ancestors. So uh, good job, guys. Um, so I'm going to look at the question and answers real quick at halftime. So um, when are we going to see your turtle? So um, I actually have my turtle with me. He's scratching on the box. So if you hear a little... <laughs> That's him um, scratching at the box. He's ready to see y'all. Do birds and holly have a symbiotic relationship? So that's a really good question. I'm glad that you guys kind of understand the, um, the concept of symbiotic relationships. I believe they do. Um, again, these holly uh, trees or holly shrubs, they have berries. And typically your birds are gonna eat berries. So yeah, they, they kind of work together. Um, that's more of a... Uh, commensalism relationship so that's basically the bird benefits but the tree itself doesn't really get affected negatively or uh positively so the tree is just kind of like hanging around and the bird is benefiting from it we have holly bushes on our base oh cool i like holly bushes they are a pain in the butt if you ever fall into one they're no fun you come out and you have scratches all over we live lots of near slash, uh, we live near a lot of slash pines and live oaks. That's really cool. Yeah, we have them all over the South. Magnolias, pine trees, and oaks, those are the ones you're gonna see everywhere you go. I mean, you can step outside your house and you'll see one of these three. How does a tree die? Um, that's a good question. So it can die for many reasons. Um, so one reason, termites, that's a big, a uh, big cause for why these trees would die is basically eat on the insides as well as other organisms. So we could have other organisms, microorganisms, we could have fungi um, that will eat on these trees. Maybe the trees don't get enough sunlight or water or nutrients. And um, if, you know, if you don't eat a lot, like if you go a whole day without eating, that would suck. But imagine going like a whole week or a whole month without eating, you'd base you wouldn't survive. So um, trees do die that way. Um, too much sun would be a bad thing. Um, so there's lots of reasons why trees could die. How old is the oldest tree ever? Honestly, I'm not sure. We can get back to that question. I only know about the live oak tree. Um, I do know about some olive trees in Jerusalem. Whenever we went, I went to Jerusalem one year and they were around whenever Jesus was around. So that was over 2000 years old. Um, but I'm not sure about the oldest, oldest tree. I just looked up the oldest living tree. And it says the oldest recorded living tree on record is a great bristle cone pine believed to have a lifespan of over 5000 years. Wow. And it is found in the White Mountains of California. Wow, that's crazy. So 5,000 years. Imagine living for that long. I mean, that tree has seen some things. Okay. Um, <laughs> but doesn't the bird poop out seeds? So back to the relationship with the holly, um, holly tree and bird relationship. That's a really good point. So I guess they would be working together. So they would be benefiting each other because then they would be um, more holly trees. So I do see your point. That's a very, very good observation. Um, I guess it's not really impacting the tree itself. It's kind of impacting the future of the tree, if you think about it. So that's a really good um, observation, anonymous attendee. Um, and then how many tree species are there? How many tree species are there? That's also a very good question. Let's look that up real quick. Um, after this question, we will get back to the presentation. I saw we had a few questions, so um, I wanted to get through those, make sure you guys were answered, and then we'll get jump back into this. Let's see, how many tree?
So, um, according to BBC.com, there are 60,000 tree species in the world, 60,000 tree species. So that's a lot of different trees. So that's a really good question. 60,000 tree species. Okay. So now we're going to get back into the presentation. Okay. Right. So um, next year we're going to talk about is the water oak. So we just talked about our live oak. Now we're going to talk about our water oak. So these guys aren't going to be as big as the live oaks and they're not going to live as long as the live oaks, but they still have really cool characteristics. So an easy way to distinguish these trees, the water oaks, is by their leaves. So the first thing we're going to look at is their leaves. So if you look down here at the bottom right image, you can see that this is a simple leaf, but it'll have three lobes. So it'll have one lobe right here. It'll have one lobe right here, and it'll have a third lobe right here. So one, two, and three. So basically, if you think about it, our W has three lobes as well. So one, two, and three. So water oak, just look at the leaves. Um, so that's a really easy way to, you know, pick up the leaf and be like, oh, three, three lobes, three lobes for W, so water oak. At least that's how I think about it. Um, I think Lacey taught me that when we were in the trails. So it's a really easy way to think about that. Um, next thing we're going to look at is that these guys produce a type of nut. So the nut they produce is a um, is an acorn. So what likes what, who eats acorns? Squirrels do. So our squirrels are going to be found on water oaks all the time. I have a few water oaks back here. Um, I don't know if you can see them. I think this is a water oak right here. It looks like a water oak, has the same leaves. Um, and we do get acorns in my backyard. So in the mornings, we'll see at least like 10 squirrels jumping from tree to tree, which is awesome. Um, my dogs like to chase these squirrels. They've never actually caught one because you live in the trees, but they still have a good time and have fun with that. Um, oaks were important to colonizers who valued their hard wood for building and acorns for food. So they'd make like acorn um, porridge. Um, they would use their wood to make houses, make equipment, um, make stuff like that. So it was very abundant. It still is. So our colonizers used this tree for that. Next plant we're going to talk about is a marsh fern. So ferns reproduce via spores located on the bottom side of the um, fronds or basically the bottom side of that leaf. So right here, we have an example of a compound leaf. So this is the leaves that I was talking about, which look like compound leaves. So if we look, this thing right here is a long, uh, basically, a long stem and then we have these little uh, leaflets so each one of these things is a leaflet you can see that it's multiple leaves but if you look at it as a whole it looks like one big leaf with individual segments so that's kind of like what i was trying to uh, explain earlier with our compound leaf so lots of little leaves making one big leaf that's the easiest way i can explain it um, and on the bottom side of these ferns, we're going to see lots of little brown um, circles or like dark brown little spots on them. Um, those are going to be spores. So that is basically the seed that these ferns reproduce. So it's not going to be an actual seed. It's going to be these little, little tiny um, spores is what we, what we call them. And with wind, insects, um, pollinators, like we talked about yesterday, they can spread and make more ferns. Um, so whenever I was a kid, 
I thought that these brown spots were like uh, a plant disease or I thought they were like bugs or, you know, that they weren't good. But in fact, they're just the seed of ferns. So if you've ever seen one before and you pick it up, don't freak out because I, I certainly had. Um, they're just the fern seed. So marsh fern grow in compound leaves and colonize and colonies that, that produce by spreading rhizosomes. So that's a subterranean plant stem that sends out shoots. So that's basically like a uh, um, a long root that you can see on the surface. Okay, witch hazel. So witch hazel is also really cool to look at. Um, the leaves were used by Native Americans as a, and modern companies to produce cooling agents. Used mainly in, in anti-inflammatory. So if you go to a pharmacy, you go to Walmart, they'll have um, bottles of this witch hazel next to like your rubbing alcohol, um, you know, like isopropyl alcohol and stuff like that. And supposedly it's supposed, it's supposed to help with itching or if you have diaper rash, not you guys, but you know, babies have diaper rash um, or you chafe or anything like that, they will cool it or it won't itch as much. So they have really interesting um, structure here, yellow little leaves growing out of it. So it's really interesting to look at. Okay, so um, can we pull up the poll for the Spanish moss please? Okay, so we're going to talk about our Spanish moss next, but I'm going to ask you guys this question. So what fruit is a Spanish moss closely related to? So what fruit is a Spanish moss closely related to? We have grapes, pineapples, strawberries, apples, and tomatoes. Do your best guess. Awesome, so we have a few people that chose pineapples. We have people that chose strawberries and we have tomatoes. So the correct answer is pineapples. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit um, because if you think about Spanish moss, the last thing you'll think about is pineapples. So Spanish moss, it's not Spanish and it is not a moss. It's in the bromeliad family and it is a epiphyte, an epiphyte. So that's one of those things that we talked about at the beginning of the presentation. Okay, so let's break this down. So first of all, um, it's not a moss because it's in the bromeliad family. So whenever uh, colonizers first came to America, they saw this Spanish moss and they basically thought that it was a moss. So they named it moss. And they thought that it resembled the beard of a Spanish man. Um, and they called it Spanish. So Spanish moss, that's kind of like where the word uh, or the name derives from. But later, once we started classifying more our plants and animals and we started putting them into certain categories Kind of like what we talked about with the arthropods, how there's many, many different arthropods, but there's different classes and subphylums and all those things. So they put them into certain groups. So once we classified and we looked at all the genetic stuff, the characteristics and all these things, we concluded that they're not 
a moss at all. They're in the bromeliad family. Um, in the bromeliad family, we have pineapples. So these guys are in the same family as pineapples. That's why they're closely related to them. Okay. Um, epiphytes, they grow on trees, but they rarely harm them. So the Spanish moss that's growing on typically your live oak trees, you're going to see lots of them on live oak trees. Um, they're not harming them at all. They're not like sucking the nutrients out of them and hurting them or anything like that. They basically just live on these oak trees. They collect sunlight because they're on tall branches and they co uh, collect humidity. So they collect water through humidity. So if you think about it, these guys don't have a root system. They don't have anything in the ground that they can absorb water and nutrients from. So they have to invent other ways to actually um, stay alive and absorb all these nutrients. And then they can reproduce via seeding, like flowering plants or pupping, where small sections will break off and drift into a new location and continue to grow. So these things are so light that they'll basically just rip off, you know, like when uh, a, a big storm or it's really windy or it's raining a lot or anything like that, they'll break off and then fly off and find another tree or another place where they can live at. Um, these guys house um, red mites, they house chiggers, ticks, all these little parasites. So they look really cool, they look really pretty, but don't um, really interact with them. Don't like grab a handful and like play with it because chances are they have little red mites, um, ticks or anything like that. Um, so what's really funny is that our colonizers, whenever they came here, not only did they name this uh, completely off, but they um, used this Spanish moss to stuff their pillows and stuff their mattresses. So if you think about it, they came on a boat and they slept on hammocks just to um, save space. And they didn't really bring anything to sleep on or anything like that. They came to colonize. That was their main job. Um, so whenever they got here, they're like, OK, well, now that we're on land, it would be nice to actually sleep on something comfortable and they stuffed their mattresses and pillows and they would wake up after a long night's rest and they would wake up with a bunch of like uh red dots and itching all over and they couldn't figure it out so after like a few nights they realized that it was the uh the spanish moss that was housing all these little red mites and stuff and eventually that's where the phrase don't let the bed bugs bite so they would tell that to each other um, whenever they were colonizing. So that's really interesting. That's where the, the um, phrase derives from. Okay, next thing we're gonna talk about is lichen. So uh, these are white spots on magnolia leaves or patches on barks of trees. Uh, so these guys are classified as a uh, composite organism and it's not considered a threat trees at all. So it's not harming the tree. Um, it's not really like killing it off or anything like that. Right here I have an example of some. You can see this is a branch off my pecan tree and lots of this lichen is growing on it. So it's really cool. It's really interesting. If you get really close to it, it has like lots of little like chambers and lots of little holes and stuff like that. So it's really interesting to look at. Then the last thing we're going to talk about is scar tissue. So um, let's, let's, let's get into this. So uh, whenever a human gets injured, you get a cut, you get a cut and you start bleeding, right? And then eventually you get a scab. So you get a scab and that's basically um, just the body protecting itself or putting a, uh, a Band-Aid over the injury and then you get a scar so eventually that heals the scab falls off and you're left with a scar so your body can regenerate itself or basically uh, grow more skin cells to close up and heal that injury with trees the bark itself um, can fall off you know and it can regrow bark 
but the inside of that tree, so the hard wood of that tree cannot repair itself. It cannot repair itself. So if it ever gets injured in the hard wood, it cannot like regrow that hard wood. It can only grow more bark over that, um, over that hard wood. So basically, if you compare it to humans, these trees get a cut, they get a scab, and then they stay there. So they don't really generate um, or regenerate the, uh, the inside of that tree. So what they can do is they build a scab and um, if it's not tough enough, they'll build another scab over that and another scab over that and another scab over that. It's kind of like putting multiple band-aids on a wound. It will never be able to repair itself so it can only um, restructure or uh, emphasize more bark in that certain spot. So whenever you see, so we look at this image over here, we see lots of little bumps on the tree. So lots of little bumps on the top of the tree. And we see one big bump as well. So that's basically something happened, you know, it was either getting cut down, we had um, insects, um, or microorganisms trying to eat on that or diseases or bacteria or fungi trying to eat at that hard wood. And the tree, the only uh, defense mechanism that this tree could do was just build more and more and more and more layers to protect itself. So it's really interesting. So if you ever see big bumps on trees, um, that's typically scar tissue. That's the way of the tree trying to protect itself. Because at some point, if the injury goes in too deep or it spreads too much, then the tree can actually die. So that's another uh, way a tree can die. Um, I know someone asked that or I answered that question earlier. Okay. So um, if you have any questions, go ahead and ask them in the Q&A and we'll get to it. So what is the oldest animal? I'm honestly not 100% sure. I know, uh, what was it, the Greenland shark live up to, or has lived up to like 300 years. Let's look this up. I know the Galapagos tortoise has lived up to 330 years. Let's see, oldest. So it looks like our tortoises are gonna be the longest living animals. Okay, what's the rarest tree? That's also a good question. Let's look that up. So rarest tree in the world right here, let's see. I can't pronounce this word, <laughs> so I'm just going to show y'all. That is the scientific name for, it's like penen, penen, penentia belicin, <laughs> I'm butchering this word, Beci, beliciana, beliciana. Okay, let's see what that looks like. Oh, wow. Okay, so these are the trees. I'm pretty sure these are the ones that are in Madagascar. So this is an example of the oldest tree in the world. Looks really cool. Or the rarest tree in the world, sorry. It's so really, really cool. Um, and they're found in New Zealand. Cool. I didn't know that. Let's see. Uh, did you know that in the winter, squirrels bury acorns? They don't know where it is. So new trees grow. Yeah, I actually um, read about that the other day. So a lot, I think it's the majority of the acorns that squirrels bury, they don't find and eventually trees grow. So um, I guess they're considered pollinators. You know, they just spread that seed all over the uh all over the ground 
We call it pineapple moss. I'm guessing you're referring to Spanish moss. Can you show us your turtle? I will get to it in just a second. I'm gonna answer these questions first. He's waiting to meet y'all already. What is the biggest tree ever? I'm pretty sure it's those, uh, those trees in Cali on um, the, what is it, the red? Huh, let's look it up. Ah, the redwoods. Okay, I was like halfway there. So the redwoods are the tallest tree um, in the world and they're found in California. So these are the trees that you can actually drive through. They've made holes in the tree and you can actually drive through them. So that, I mean, that to me is really crazy. Um, I mean, you could, you could get so much, you could probably, you cut one of those trees down and you could have enough paper for all the schools in the United States. That's a little exaggeration, but that's how big I think they are. Turtle. <laughs> he shows your turtle. <laughs> Show your turtle. Wow, you guys are really like looking forward to meet my turtle. Uh, did you know that octopus is so smart that if you put it in the jar, it will be able to twist off the top? Yeah, that's a really good observation. Um, octopuses are, or octopus is the s smartest invertebrate. So invertebrate means that they don't have a backbone. So octopus are the smartest animal without a backbone. So if you didn't know that, it's really interesting. I really want an uh, octopus at some point in my life, but I need a really good uh, filtration system. I really need a good tank. Um, so eventually in the future, when I make enough money, I'll probably have an octopus. Show the turtle. Okay, okay. Uh, all right, let's get, I'll show you all the turtle. He's waiting to meet y'all. Okay, so right here I have Yoshi. So this is my tortoise. He's super chill. Right now he's trying to back up. If you see him, he'll like he's just slowly backing up. He's a little camera shy, if you can tell. Uh, so this is a Sokata tortoise. These guys can live up to 150 years. So anywhere from 80 years to 150 years. So he's probably going to outlive me um, to put him in my will. So that way my son or any other relative that wants a tortoise will be able to keep him. He's super funny. I guess he's like you're super camera shy right now. Um, these guys, we don't know if it's a boy or a girl right now because, um, the shell structure. So if you look right here, I believe if it grows, if this part grows outwards, then it is a boy. And if it grows inwards, then it's a girl. So we're going to be able to tell that once he's a little or he, he or she is a little bit older. So we don't know for sure right now. So we got him a gender neutral name, um, Yoshi. I feel like that can go either way. Um, he's really chill. He wants to walk around right now. He's super active. He's super cute. Um, and he can hide into a shell. So like we talked about early, uh, was it Tuesday? These guys can retract into a shell. So if I get too close to its face, you see how he kind of like sneaks in and then he'll like stick his head out. So he does that whenever he's scared or like whenever he's a little shy. Um, he's not, he really, he knows who I am. So he's not too scared of me. Um, it's really funny, I love his little legs. <laughs> they look like little tree trunks. <laughs> but he's super chill i really love him um we feed him like lettuce zucchini cucumbers squash um yesterday we fed we fed him uh watermelon we fed him strawberries uh pieces of grape and cantaloupe so he eats berries as well um 
Right now, he lives inside of a plastic bin, like one of those storage bins. Um, and eventually, when he gets big enough, then we're going to release him to the yard. So that way he can run around or walk around. I guess these guys don't really run, but he could walk around and, um, you know, eat grass, eat all the, the leaves and fruits that fall off my trees, as well as the flowers. So he really likes azalea flowers, he or she, <laughs> Yoshi. Um, what else can I tell you about him? His species is originally from Africa, um, but I actually got him at a turtle or a reptile show. So there was a reptile show in Slidell and um, we went over there and there was reptiles of all different, you know, places. There were venomous snakes, non-venomous snakes. There were turtles. There were, uh, what else was there? Um, I mean, just all different types of reptiles. There were like caiman alligators. Um, so there's lots of little guys. And I was either between him or a chameleon because my wife has always wanted a chameleon. But once she saw how cute Yoshi was, she was like, oh, we got to get him. He likes to walk backwards for some reason. But yeah, this is my tortoise. Again, he's super easy to take care of. If you ever want a pet and you, your parents are like, oh, it's too much money or uh, he's high maintenance, you know, like a dog, you always have to give constant attention to. Um, with Yoshi, we kind of just let him walk around the house and our dogs don't mind him. He's uh, really easy to take care of. You only feed him once or twice a week and he'll eat by himself. You only soak him like once or twice a week. So we have a little pool for him and he'll he'll get in there and soak himself. So um and he was only like 70 bucks so you know that's a really good investment 70 bucks for 80 years of lifetime companionship i mean i feel like that's a great deal so yeah if you ever want to get a, a pet i would strongly recommend a tortoise because these guys are awesome they don't bite either um they're really chill like i said so yeah uh right now we're going to look and see if we have any more questions so precious yeah i love him we saved the three-legged turtle wow that's crazy yes uh so do your dogs like him yes my dogs don't mind him at all they'll come up to him sniff him and they'll kind of just walk away and they kind of just let him do his own business um so yeah my dogs are really chill on that side so yeah if you guys don't have let's check the chat box real quick so you guys have any more questions i know we're a little bit over time but I promised you guys I would show you all my tortoise. Um, I did not do it last time, so let's see. Wow, those dogs are well behaved. Yeah, I think I trained them well. They're awesome. Okay, I don't see any more questions. Okay, so um, me and Yoshi are going to say bye. I'm going to let him run around the yard for a little bit so that way he can stretch out his little legs. Okay, and if you guys don't have any more questions for me, um, we will see you guys at 11 o'clock. So make sure to come back in a few minutes. Uh, and Lacey is going to show you all a really cool biosphere really cool uh, activity you guys can do at home. So I know most of you guys are bored of being at home all day. So this will give you all an opportunity to actually do something besides watching TV or playing video games or anything like that. Um, so make sure to tune in at 11. And um, if you're busy for whatever reason, we'll catch you tomorrow at nine o'clock. And then again at 11 o'clock, we're gonna talk about meteorology. So for those who don't know what meteorology is, uh, we're gonna teach you all about it. So. Uh, we'll see y'all at 11. Make sure to come back at 11. Okay, guys, welcome back to the um, 11 a.m. session of Backyard Biology. Um, my name is Lacey. For those of you who might be new, I am a uh, marine educator at the Marine Education Center. I've been working there for about a year. 
and I got my degree at Southern Miss um, in marine biology. So I've been a part of Southern Miss for a really long time, and I'm really happy to be able to provide this um, type of camp for you guys. Um, I do have someone helping me today, and I will let him introduce himself. Hello, my name is Riley. I'll be helping out Lacey. I'm also one of the educators here. Um, I did get my degree at University of South Alabama, so I went to another school, but we'll be working together today for this. Okay, thanks, Riley. Um, today, we are going to be talking about um, something you can do at home. It's a really fun activity. I had a lot of fun making mine, um, and it is going to be called a tabletop biosphere. So it's a lot, a lot of fun. You get to go to really cool places and collect things to make it. Um, but before we get into the activity, I'm going to talk a little bit about biomes. So um, let me share my screen. All right, so to start off, what is a biome? So biomes are certain types of environments or habitats that have certain um, characteristics to them. So there are terrestrial biomes that would be found on the land, and then there are aquatic biomes that are obviously going to be found either in freshwater or saltwater, um, marine, marine water. Um, so there's actually not a set number to how many biomes are on the earth. So they're actually constantly shifting and changing because those boundaries are not always going to be defined and um, climate does change quite often. So um, you can see on this slide right here, there are a number of terrestrial and aquatic biomes, but it kind of depends on who you talk to about how many there are. Um, like I said, biomes move as the climate changes. So about 10,000 years ago, parts of North Africa were actually really, really lush. So lush with lots of plants um, and they had lots of really flowing rivers and hip so hippos, giraffes, crocodiles, um, all those types of animals that are um, typically found there were among um, really lush plant life, trees, stuff like that. So gradually that climate dried out. And so today this region of North Africa is actually part of the Sahara Desert, which is actually the world's largest desert. So like I said, not all scientists classify biomes in the same way. So some use a very broad classification. So um, they're not very specific, but they will count as few as six biomes. So um, I've got way more than six classified right here. Um, but these basic six are going to be the forest, the grassland, freshwater, marine, desert, and the tundra. Um, so those are your basic six, but other scientists will use more precise classifications and they list dozens and dozens of different biomes. So they'll consider different types of forests to be different biomes. So you have, for example, the tropical rainforest that is warm and wet year round because, you know, it's, it's essentially constantly raining in the tropical rainforest. That's why I call it rainforest. Um, but you, on the other hand, you have the temperate deciduous forests, and those have cold winters, warm summers, and have lots of um, trees that lose their leaves, um, which is why they're called deciduous. Um, and that is going to be a completely different biome. Two forests, but two completely separate um, habitats from each other. Um, so two forests, but are very, very different. Um, and then you have something called the taiga forest. So I have the taiga um, listed right here. And taigas are in cold regions and they are dominated by cone bearing trees such as firs and spruces. So we don't have a lot of those here, um, at least in South Mississippi, we don't. Um, and so this is a different type of forest completely separate from those other two. Now for today's purposes, we are going to discuss four biomes that are fairly distinct from one another. So they have, do have some similarities, um, but they do have very um, specific qualities that make it a very clear um, distinction from one another. So we are going to discuss two aquatic and two terrestrial biomes. Um, so the first aquatic is going to be the freshwater um, biome. So a freshwater biome has very low amounts of salt in it. So it does have a little, not a lot, but very small amount. Um, 
And in that water, you know, it'll include ponds, streams, lakes, and rivers. So um, a few different types of freshwater environments. And then the other aquatic biome that we're gonna talk about is marine. So I have also listed marine right here um, under aquatic biomes. And this is gonna be the largest biome in the world because the marine biome includes the five major oceans that cover 70% of the earth. So that is why um, it is the biggest biome because you know, as we know, earth is majority water. Um, and then the two um, terrestrial biomes that we're gonna talk about um, is the tundra. So the tundra is a flat and cold um, area with low plants like grasses and moss that only grow um, during a very short summer. But they also have a very thick layer of ice that is right below the surface um, called permafrost all year round. So there's essentially a block of ice and on top of that block of ice there is um, soil. So that's why these plants are going to be really, really low um, to the ground, very short because their roots cannot penetrate that permafrost that's there year round. Um, so that's why they're really short. Tundra is a really cool place. We'll discuss it a little bit further in a little bit. And then we're going to talk about the desert. So the desert makes up the hottest biome, but can also get really, really cold at night and in the winter. So these temperature changes make this place super extreme, a very extreme environment where lots of animals have to burrow underground to find a very stable temperature um, to live at. Um, plants and animals that live here must be able to withstand long periods without water because it is the desert. And as we know, in the desert, it does not rain all that often. All right. So this is a map of the globe and all of these different colors represent all of the different types of biomes that we have. And some of these, you know, I didn't include on the list and it just, you know, shows you how much, you know, scientists vary and they have different opinions on how many different biomes there actually are. So like you've got this pink right here and all of this is going to be on the north. So this is going to be your subarctic zone. Um, and then you have the white. So you see this right here is kind of outlined in pink and in the middle there's white. So this is gonna be your ice caps. And then you can see down here um, in Arctica, there's law of all ice caps. So this is going to be another one of those extreme environments. Um, we'll talk about that in a little bit too. Um, and then, you know, you've got tropical, uh, tropical rainforests, you've got um, humid, sub, humid subtropical, um, just lots of different types of, you know, biomes and environments that, um, depending on who you talk to, are going to be way different from one another. All right, so let's start off with this freshwater biome. So like I said, it is going to be made up of lakes, ponds, streams, and rivers. And freshwater actually covers about 20% of the earth. So um, lots of fresh water, um, but only about 3% of the water that um, you know, we're allowed to, you know, that is healthy for us to take in our bodies or you know, to wash our clothes and take showers in comes from freshwater biomes. Um, but this freshwater biome consists of moving water and also contains many different types of fish. So uh, the streams and rivers are all constantly going to be flowing um, and your lakes, and your ponds, you know, they're not going to be flowing very much, but sometimes, you know, like going to be, you know, connected to a river. So it will have some flow um, aspect to it. But um, about 99% of all fresh water either comes from ice or is located in an aquifer. So an aquifer is kind of like you dig and you dig and you dig. Um, this is how a lot of ponds are made. Um, like you dig, you reach a certain point, you hit an aquifer, which is kind of like underwater uh, or underground water. Um, and then that will create a pond. So my parents have a pond at their house and that is how um, that was made. You know, you reach an aquifer and it keeps it um, sustained. And then the largest freshwater biome that we have on planet Earth is going to be in the Florida Everglades. So the Florida Everglades is a very diverse area. So you've got all of this fresh water, you know, probably mixed with some brackish water. It is Florida. Um, so brackish water is a mixture of fresh water and salt water. Um, 
but you know there's more than just fish here so you would it sustains animals like alligators and even crocodiles you know we've talked about in our reptiles lesson that you know crocodiles actually do live in florida everglades they are invasive so they're not supposed to be there um and just lots of other really cool types of animals so coastal birds um many different species of fish and you know you get the occasional really big snake um that lives in the florida everglades so this being the largest freshwater biome also contains a big, um, a large diversity um, of different types of animals. So that is your freshwater biome. Now we are going to talk about the marine biome, probably my favorite biome. Um, so there is about one cup of salt for every gallon of water in the ocean. Um, so there's lots and lots of salt in the ocean and ocean water is actually constantly moving. So that cold water is going to be moving from the poles while warm water is moving from the tropics and you'll have certain places in the currents that it gets mixed. Um, but the ocean is constantly moving and flowing as well as some of our freshwater um, habitats. Well, the ocean biome will contain um, lots of life as well. It's a very diverse place. It contains coral reefs, which are actually gonna be their own separate biome. So a marine biome is kind of like that umbrella term, kind of like I mentioned with arthropods yesterday. Um, so you've got marine, a marine biome, but you've got a coral reef and you've got all these different types of habitats um, within the marine biome. You've got open ocean and all these different types of places. Um, you've got seagrass beds, so that's going to be under a marine biome as well. Um, but the majority of volcanic activity actually occurs underwater in the ocean. So of all the volcanoes on Earth, um, the majority of that activity is going to be underwater in the ocean. So that's how, you know, the Hawaiian Islands were formed. Um, those are all formed by um, lots and lots of volcanic activity. Um, that's why if you see lots of pictures um, from Hawaii, you know, you'll see lots of black rock looking that looks like it used to be flowing. So that is gonna be hardened lava. Um, so really cool. Um, volcanic activity also comes from, um, or is, is associated with things called hydrothermal vents. So if you ask me, that could probably be another biome in itself because it contains, it maintains certain life that cannot live anywhere else. So um, things like Yeti crabs, things like certain types of shrimp, um, bacteria can live here. Um, tube worms, tube worms are insane to watch. They're insane to learn about. They're these huge, you know, six plus feet long worms essentially that live in this really, really hot environment because this hydrothermal vent is going to be constantly expelling these hot gases um, that sustains all of this different types of interesting life. Um, and what's funny about hydrothermal vents is they can actually turn off. And once they turn off, um, it, a whole new group of um, animals comes in and they can live and thrive in there too. So it can be on and then it can turn off and then it can turn right back on. So um, really, really crazy stuff. We also get lots of precious metals from hydrothermal vents um, and they are exploited a lot by people as well. You know, mine, you can mine hydrothermal vents, um, which isn't probably the best thing to do because when you do that, you're destroying um, a habitat and an environment. So you can also call the marine biome a global ocean, which covers, you know, 70% of the earth, but uh, the marine biome is going to be divided geographically into regions. So these regions are known as our oceans. So you've got what we call ocean basins, and that is going to be the Atlantic, the Pacific, the Arctic, the Southern, and the Indian Ocean. Um, so the Southern Ocean is going to be the newest named ocean. Um, not recently in scientific terms, but not recently in, you know, like people, you know, just living terms. Um, so the Southern Ocean is going to be the newest, so it just got its own name. Um, so the marine biome is crazy cool, my favorite biome by far. Um, and if you have a favorite one that I talk about, you know, put it in the chat. I would really like to know um, what y'all's favorite biome that we talk about today, or if you've learned about biomes in school um, and you have a favorite one, let me know. I think that'd be really cool to know. All right, next we're going to talk about the tundra. Um, so the tundra is an ecosystem near the North Pole in the Arctic Circle. 
And this is going to be the coldest of all of the biomes. So winters are going to be extremely, extremely cold with temperatures that fall below negative 34 degrees Celsius. So that is crazy cold. Um, something that I don't think I could handle very well. Um, and then summers, my favorite time of year, only last two months. So um, temperatures are still very cold in the summer in the tundra and they range from about three to 12 degrees Celsius, three to 12. It's not very warm, <laughs> not very warm at all. Um, so although some parts of the tundra are in, inhabited, um, you know, such as, or people do live there, such as like Alaska and Canada, um, they are considered a part of the tundra biome, um, even though people do live there. Um, the majority of the tundra has not been visited by most people because of such harsh conditions. So I would say, you know, parts of Canada and Alaska are, you know, on the outskirts of this biome, the tundra biome. So that's why people are able to live there. But um, the majority of the tundra people do not live there. It does not sustain lots of life just because it's, so, it's such an extreme area. Um, so the tundra biome actually has about 400 varieties of flowers. So lots of different types of flowers and plants, but only about 48 different species of animals. So um, not lots of animal life can live there, can be, um, can thrive in this environment, can survive in this environment because it's so cold, it's so harsh, it's very hard to live there. Um, so during the summer in the tundra biome, it is daylight 24 hours a day. Um, so that's kind of crazy to think about. I know in Alaska, you know, they get pretty constant sunlight um, or light in general during the summer months too. And, you know, um, it's very hard to, you know, keep your rhythm in your body, you know, in, on track because it is constant sunlight. Your body knows when it's daylight, your body knows when it's nighttime. Um, so it's really hard to keep in good health because of that. So they take, people who live in Alaska, you know, will take certain measures to um, make sure that their bodies are staying on track and staying on rhythm with nighttime and daytime. Um, so there are actually two different types of tundra. You have the Arctic tundra and the Alpine tundra. So the Arctic tundra is located within the Arctic circle and then the Alpine tundra is the um, area that is high up in the mountains and above the trees. So I included some mountainous pictures um, in the slide just to kind of showcase that, um, showcase both areas really. All right, so the next biome that we will discuss is going to be the desert biome. So the desert biome is an ecosystem that forms due to the low level of rainfall it receives every year. So um, they don't get a lot of rain. I think we all know that about deserts is that it barely ever rains. Um, and there are four major types of desert in the desert biome. So you have a hot and dry desert, you have a semi-arid, a coastal, and a cold desert. Um, so all very different from each other. Um, so although daytime temperatures of the desert biome are very, very hot, they can actually get really cold at nighttime too. Um, so because of this, lots of desert animals tend to be nocturnal. And they, so that means they sleep during the day and they come out at night to, you know, hunt and find food and forage, do whatever they do. Um, because the temperatures are going to be more tolerable during this time. Um, excuse me. So dust storms actually occur in uh, the desert biomes because the wind picks up the dust from the surface and these storms can be up to a mile high and travel over a hundred miles. So I don't know if you guys have been watching the Weather Channel a lot lately, but we have some Saharan dust coming our way all the way across the ocean. Um, now this might sound a little bit scary, but it's nothing to be worried about. Um, it is going to be way up high in the sky. You're not going to have piles of sand from the Sahara Desert um, laid up on the beach or on the roads. Um, it might make sunsets really actually way prettier. You know, they'll get super orange and red and have all those really sandy rust colors um, in them. Or if it rains, you know, if it rains and after that rains evaporates, it might leave a little bit of dust um, on your car. So it's actually kind of a really neat phenomenon if you think about it. I mean, it does happen um, fairly occasionally. I would say I have heard of this happening before. Um, 
And they're actually very good for hurricane season because it will calm down, you know, our tropical storms. So we just had one a couple weeks past. Um, so it's predicted that we're not going to have one again anytime super soon because of the Saharan dust coming all the way across um, into the Gulf of Mexico. So pretty neat phenomenon. You can totally look that up after this lesson is over with. I recommend it. It's really cool to learn about. Um, so there are actually some deserts in Antarctica that are known as cold deserts, and they are considered deserts because of the very small amount of vegetation that grows there. So um, you've got all these three pictures right here. So I chose, you know, these hot and dry deserts because that's what we're um, known for, or that's what we think of when we think of a desert. Um, but there are some plants, and then you have this area over here where it's just constant, it's nothing but sand dunes. Um, but Antarctica, is going to be one of those cold deserts. So even though there's tons of, um, you know, snow and ice and these forms of water, it doesn't rain, you know, that snow never melts and um, feeds the ground. You know, plants get really, really hard to live there um, because of their really harsh temperatures and soil and there's probably permafrost there too. So um, it's a very, very harsh environment. So it's called, Antarctica is going to be a cold desert. Now the desert biome can actually be found on every single continent except for Europe. Europe is the only place that you cannot be able to find um, a desert biome. So I thought that was really cool. All right, now we're gonna get a little bit into the activity. So what you'll need to build your tabletop biosphere is you're gonna need some kind of jar with a lid. So that can be, you know, a clear mason jar. It could be an old fish tank you have laying around or it could be a very, like one of those big two liter um, clear soda bottles. Um, you know, just whatever kind of suits you as long as it has a lid. It's very important to hold in, you know, gases um, from photosynthesis and oxygen and stuff like that. So you're going to need biotic and abiotic materials. So you've probably never heard of these words before, um, but if you have, that's great. Um, I'll go over it. So biotic is going to mean, mean living and abiotic is going to mean non-living. So you'll need some things that are alive and some things that are not alive. So some examples of biotic materials will be plants and algae. Um, so any kind of vegetation that you see um, around in a place that you pick out, um, totally gather some of those up for your abiotic or for your biotic materials. For your abiotic, you can think get things like sand, you know, mud, sticks, seashells, rocks, um, anything you think of that is non-living. Um, and then finally, or you'll need a really, really good environment to work with. So you can pick places like a pond or a lake. You can pick a marsh, the beach. Um, you can pick rivers and streams, um, but you'll want to collect the items that are special to your location that are that really characterize you know a pond or a lake or a marsh um and then finally you'll need a window with really good sunlight um this is important for the plants and those um biotic materials that you collect so if those plants stay alive um fingers crossed that they do um they will need to um photosynthesize to help create oxygen for your biosphere so sunlight will trigger photosynthesis, which puts off oxygen as a byproduct. And then this will help your biosphere to be self-sustaining. So this means you don't really have to take much care of it. Um, and the life that you maybe that you collect or accidentally collect will be um, very healthy in your biosphere. Now, here's some examples of life that you could um, accidentally collect. Um, so you can find things like copepods. So copepods are super cool. Um, they are a type of plankton. So this is this guy right here in the top left. Um, copepods are really neat because they are some of the bigger types of plankton that you, if you look really, 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 really hard, you um, could be able to see with your eyes, like your naked eyes. You won't need a microscope or anything like that. Um, but they're really neat because they are a type of zooplankton. So zooplankton means your animal-like plankton. So these guys are going to be um, kind of at the top of the food chain in the plankton world. Um, they feed a lot on phytoplankton. So phytoplankton is going to be your um, plant-like plankton. So um, your copepods are going to be kind of important in your biosphere. Um, 
and you, if you go to an aquatic environment, which you should, um, you are likely to get copepods. Um, you might accidentally find some tadpoles. Um, so tadpoles are really, really fun. And if you keep your biosphere, you know, healthy long enough, you might actually kind of watch these tadpoles go through their metamorphosis from coming, becoming, you know, these really tiny little things into like a full blown frog or, a, you know, a toad or whatever. <laughs> um, but tadpoles would be really cool. And then, you know, you've got different types of plankton in general. So um, there's lots of different types of plankton depending on where you go. Um, and then finally, algae. So algae will accumulate over time in your biosphere. So it will grow on the sides of whatever container you choose. Um, and this is totally normal. So algae is definitely going to be one of those abiotic um, materials. So I'm going to walk you through kind of what I did to create my biosphere. I had a lot of fun doing it. Um, so I found this little path um, near the beach um, where I go pretty frequently. And um, it kind of led me down to this little area, this little spit of sand that uh, led right into the water. Um, and I collected lots of different types of grass. Um, so all this grass along the sides here was everywhere. Um, and so I picked some of that, made sure to get some of the roots. Um, so it would have a chance of staying alive. Um, and then I really picked out um, lots of things that were um, good characteristics of this kind of marshy, brackish um, environment. So I picked out lots of sand, lots of different types of um, grasses. I found some shells. I found one um, half of a um, mussel shell. That's what it was, a mussel. Um, it had barnacles on it. I wasn't sure if those barnacles were dead or alive, but I thought it was cool. So I um, collected it from my biosphere. Um, it's important to get sand or mud or whatever kind of sediment is in your environment too because you know that is a really really big part of whatever environment you choose so in this kind of marshy habitat it was sand um so i gathered some sand as well um and i also got water from this area so water is going to be crazy important because it's going to contain all of the of that microscopic life um that's going to be really important in an environment like this um so I thought I was gonna thought I wanted to show you guys some other really cool things that I didn't collect from my biosphere, but I thought they're really cool. I found them just walking down the beach. Um, so this is a crab hole. Um, I'm not sure what type of crab it is. I know it is either a ghost crab or a fiddler crab. Um, I saw both, but I didn't see, you know, what went into this home. Um, but this, I know for a fact, is a fiddler crab's home because I saw him duck in there um, when I walked up to it. Um, but I think these things are really, really neat just because of the way they're built and how they look on the outside. All these little balls are little balls of sand. So um, I believe the crab just kind of takes kind of a mouthful of sand and um, spits it out when he comes back out of his hole. So it's actually really neat. It's really, really pretty. Um, just to remember that this is a living thing's home. So you don't want to like put anything in the, um, in his home. Like you don't want to shove like a stick or some grass or, um, and you don't want to stomp on it and close it because whatever lives in this hole, you know, made it and works really, really hard on it. So remember to respect these, um, crabs homes. Um, but this is a fiddler crab for sure. And then this guy right here, this is a periwinkle snail. So these are really indicative of how healthy your ecosystem is. So this guy was just right around where I collected all of my materials from my biosphere. And I accidentally got a very, very tiny little snail that I didn't even know was in there until like three days after, afterwards because I saw him um, climbing on the side of the glass um, in my jar. But periwinkle snails are super cool and there was a lot of them um, where I went and collected. So thought it would be really cool to show you guys. And then this guy right here, this is um, what we call a tenophore for sea snot. Uh, sea snot's kind of more fun, but this is a type of jelly, um, a jellyfish. But these guys are really neat because they don't sting you. They don't have stinging, um, you know, tentacles or cells on them at all. So, you know, they're really fun to pick up. And um, it's one of those easy things that, you know, you see washed up on the beach a lot that are um, super interesting. Uh, they're also really neat because they have 
the ability to light up pretty much. So that is going to be called bioluminescence. So I don't know if you've ever been to the aquarium. Um, I believe the Audubon Aquarium in New Orleans has um, some big guys like this, like this and um, they'll kind of light, light up rainbow colors all along their edges and they'll kind of do it in waves. So um, it looks like flashing lights and they're really, really fun. Um, but they do this for animals bioluminous for a few reasons. So not just these guys, you know, even a type of shark has the ability to do that. Um, so it's really, really cool how animals learned how to produce their own light. Um, but next we have another type of jellyfish. So this guy right here is a sea nettle. So sea nettles do have stinging cells. They do have tentacles. So you can see all of these right here. This is the part that you want to avoid. Um, I was just walking down the beach and glanced over into the water and this guy was almost washed up on shore. So I went and found a stick or something. I think it was a stick. And I scooped him onto the shore, took a picture of him and put him back. Um, if you've ever watched Finding Nemo, the first one, not Finding Dory, Finding Nemo, um, you know, you'll learn that the tops don't sting you. So um, if you were to bump into the bell of this jellyfish, that's what this part is called, the bell, um, you know, you probably wouldn't even notice it because you're, um, you wouldn't feel it, you wouldn't get stung. But if you were unfortunate enough to get wrapped up in these guys right here, you would definitely know it um, because these do have those stinging cells that, um, if uh, like a fish is small enough, it will stun that fish and then they can bring it into their mouth and um, digest it. But um, it does hurt when you get stung by a sea nettle, even though it's not the biggest, baddest jellyfish out there. Um, so if you do ever get stung by a jellyfish, I recommend vinegar. So maybe take a little bit of white vinegar to the beach with you, just a little bitty one, just in case you ever get stung. Um, that is the best way to get rid of that pain really, really quickly. Um, there is one of those big bad jellyfish that I mentioned, um, and it is called the box jellyfish. Um, super common around, you know, the Australian shorelines um, and on the beaches, you know, where surfing is really popular, they will have huge, huge bottles of um, vinegar on standby, like on posts, um, in sections down the beach, just in case, you know, everybody or anybody got stung, you can instantly, you know, um, wash your legs off or whatever part of your body that got stung and then run to the hospital because box jellyfish are actually really intense um you do not want to get stung by one of those and lastly i saw something really cool so there was um an old post um from an old um dock that got washed away and these guys were um settling around this post so these are atlantic ribbed mussels um and they are alive and i know they're living because atlantic ribbed mussels have two shells to make one whole animal. So these are animals. They're not, you know, plants or just shells. They're animals. There's an animal living inside both of those shells. So they're called bivalves. So that's how you know they have two halves or yeah, they have two halves to them. Um, so one shell and then one shell and then an animal in the middle squished like this. Um, and what was really neat is that the tide was going out. And so these guys do need to be in water um, fairly often to be able to survive. But um, they have adapted um, some tolerance to be able to live outside of water for a short amount of time. So they will close up really, really tight and they will retain some of that water. Um, so the animal inside of them will be able to, you know, gather oxygen and still be able to survive for a little while um, until the tide comes back in and then they are submerged in water and then they'll open just a little bit and they'll have little kind of arms or tentacles kind of floating out of the top and they'll collect, um, they'll filter the water, they'll collect tiny little um, microscopic animals like those plankton that we talked about. Um, and then again, when the tide goes back out, they'll close back up. Um, but it was really interesting because as I was walking around in the marsh and I was collecting all of my items for my biosphere, you could hear these guys closing up. So they close up so tight um, that you can kind of hear air being pushed out of them. It sounded just, just sounded like bubbles. And it was a really cool thing because I'd never heard it before. And my best guess was that it was these muscles closing up. Um, so that was really, really cool. 
So this is what my biosphere looked like the day, um, the day of or the day after I put it together. Um, I think it was the day after because this looks a lot more clear. So once you put it together, it's going to be kind of murky um, because you've just stirred up lots of sediment and stuff like that. Um, but this here is that Atlantic ribbed muscle with all those barnacles on them that I said. And this muscle was not alive because I found only one half of its shell with no animal attached to it. Um, it just had those barnacles on it. So I thought that would be a really cool um, way to mix together biotic and abiotic material. Um, so living and non-living, you know, into one little um, kind of decoration, I guess, for my biosphere. Um, but after about a day, um, that water will settle and will be, it will become more clear. So you can see some really cool stuff. So in this next um, slide, there is a video of some animals, some microscopic animals that I saw in my biosphere. So let me make sure it's volume all the way down. Um, so you will probably not be able to see them too well in this video. Um, so you'll have to watch in the sunny areas for little black specks just kind of swimming around. Um, but in the next video that I have to show you, you'll be able to see them a lot better. So right here, this little guy. Um, let's see. Um, that was just a good showcase of really what all is in my biosphere. So this right here is a piece of driftwood that I just found on the beach. Um, lots of sticks. Here's that shell, lots of different types of grass. And then there's sand all along the bottom there. So in this next video, it's really zoomed in. And I was focused on this little guy at first. I didn't know what it was. I thought it was moving, but I wasn't sure. Um, and then you'll see something moving over here. So the things you'll see moving are going to be copepods. Um, so I was watching him or him or her, whatever it is. And then over here, when I zoom in to this little guy right here, this is a copepod, um, one of those zooplankton, one of those microscopic animals that I really didn't mean to collect. I was hoping there were some in there, um, but you never know. And then if you look right up in here, those little dark, uh, little black dots kind of darting everywhere, those are copepods as well. Um, so lots and lots of life um, that I accidentally collected in this biosphere. Um, it was really fun to make, and I'll play this video again because it's just really fun. Um, Lots of really cool stuff you can collect. So like I said, I accidentally got a baby periwinkle snail. I didn't even know it was in there. It was probably on a blade of grass that I picked up or in the, um, on top of the sand that I collected. Um, so he's still in there. And then, you know, I've got all those copepods. And then I actually saw the tiniest little baby shrimp you've ever seen in your life. Um, so very, very small little grass shrimp and What's really neat about that is that that grass shrimp is probably going to be able to feed on those copepods. So I've had my biosphere sitting in my window for about a week um, and it's really murky now because there has been algae buildup on the side. Um, and so that shrimp's probably enjoyed some really good copepod meals. Um, so there might not be any more copepods left in my biosphere because that little guy ate them all. Um, so I will um, stop sharing my screen and I'm going to Hold up my biosphere. So this is what it looks like. Um, as you can see, it's a lot murkier now than it was um, in the videos. And that's just because, you know, algae build up. It's been sitting in my window for about a week. Um, but yeah, it's really, really fun. You know, I check it out every day to see if I can see something new. Um, it's really fun. So I really recommend that y'all, you know, if you live near the beach, you know, go to the beach with your adult, whoever your adult may be, your mom, your dad, your grandma, your grandpa. Um, and you, uh, you collect all those items that are, are characteristic of whatever biome you choose. And you collect all that stuff and see what you got because it's really neat. Um, there were lots of hermit crabs around where I was collecting. Um, I don't recommend getting hermit crabs because, you know, you don't want to take them from their home. They're obviously alive and um, very comfortable in that environment. And I, I would feel bad putting them in a jar. So um, I did not, I left all the hermit crabs alone. Um, but if you're really lucky like me, um, you'll get accidentally get a snail and a shrimp and all of those really cool couple pods. So um, 
if you guys have any questions about biomes or if you want to see the videos again or um, you're unsure about something, we can totally ask questions. Um, there's the, uh, notice the chat was blowing up, so let me check out the chat. Um, I have a book about biomes, except it's in Spanish. Well, that's really cool. Um, my favorite biome is the tundra. Let's see, uh, Kenzie says the rainforest is her favorite. Um, Haley says she also likes the desert biome. Ariana says we have a bunch of frogs and tadpoles near my house. Well, that's really cool. That can be a little biome. Um, Quentin says calm jellies are cool. Do we have to do it at a beach? No, you do not. Um, like you can go to any, I recommend an aquatic environment because you know, water is gonna sustain lots of different life. So um, you don't have to go to the beach. It's just where I chose to go because it's like my favorite place ever. Um, but you can go to a pond or a little stream in your backyard or um, you know, whatever kind of water that is near you where you think it would be really interesting to collect things from. So you don't have to do it at a beach. What are the red things? Um, so the red things on this jar, they're just chips of paint um, from old projects. Um, so it's not an animal. And what is a copepod? So a copepod is a type of plankton. So they are called zooplankton because they are animal-like plankton. So a plankton is a type of animal um, or copepods are a type of animal. Um, but you can have zooplankton, which are gonna be your animal-like plankton. And then you have phytoplankton, which are plant-like plankton. So um, zooplankton will feed on phytoplankton a lot. In fact, copepods are one of the main grazers on phytoplankton. So they kind of keep that in check a lot. Um, and then you say you like the tundra biome. The tundra biome is really cool. You got lots of really cool stuff that goes on there. Um, let me check the Q&A. Do you live close to the beach? I did kind of live close to the beach. Um, I live in uh, Ocean Springs, so decently close. You know, I can drive for about five or 10 minutes and make it to the beach. What is the most venomous jellyfish? Um, the box jellyfish that I mentioned earlier, that is going to be the most dangerous. Um, you don't want to get stung by one of those. Um, so that's probably the most venomous um, or poisonous. I'm not sure which. Um, where did you find the snails? So I found those snails. They are going to be living amongst the marsh grass near um, the habitat that I chose. So um, I just went to the beach and found a little marshy area. So they're actually, if you see lots of periwinkle snails, that means that your environment is super healthy. So you have a very healthy environment if there are lots of those periwinkle snails. Um, that's called a keystone species. Um, so I accidentally found that snail. I did not mean to pick him up, but he's in there. So um, I'm actually going to go today and dump this out because I kind of feel bad that the snail's in there. So I keep it for about a week. Um, things will get a little smelly just because, you know, sitting in a jar in a window all day long. Um, so I do recommend eventually dumping it, dumping it back out where you found the things. Um, just, you know, be nice to whatever animals may still be living in there. They don't want to live in a jar their whole lives. Um, but if you guys don't have any more questions or really fun comments um, about anything, we've, anything that we've talked about all day today, so even earlier this morning, um, I'll answer those questions, and if not, then um, we can say bye. So, we'll wait a couple minutes if y'all don't have any more. Oop, there's something. Do periwinkle snails need to breathe air? Yes, they do. They do need oxygen to survive, um, but they can pull oxygen from the water. So there are oxygen molecules found in water. Um, and so they will be able to survive off of that. And you also, I didn't mention this, so you also need to leave a little bit of room at the top of your jar for those gases to build up when your plants um, do photosynthesis. So um, it's very important to leave a gap. And so if you get a snail like me, um, that snail can just crawl up you know, above the water and breathe the oxygen that is being released by photosynthesis in that little gap. So yes, they do need air. Good question. All right. Oh, 
every time I click it away. If you don't live near any source of water, where would you find any type of algae? So um, where would you find any type of algae? That's a really good question. Um, you know, when it rains and if you have like a ditch, it might not be the cleanest place to go, but it is, you know, it, it does support certain amounts of life. So tadpoles will actually be um, born and they'll grow up and they'll do their metamorphosis in like ditches sometimes. So if you just have a ditch that's dug out and it's recently rained really heavily, um, you can do that. You can collect rainwater from there. And then um, when you collect the plants around that um, source, that will grow algae. So um, the fact that you will have algae growth is really good. And that means your um, tabletop biosphere is being self-sustaining. So if you just have, you know, um, a ditch for rainwater to run off, um, that is, it's equally as good as a water source as anything else. Um, so if you guys do this, you know, don't go alone, go with a parent, um, go with an adult that you trust, uh, that you know and you trust um, to go with you and they can help you or they can build their own with you. So it's really cool. And this was a really, really fun activity and a really fun topic. I think this is my favorite lesson that I got to teach this week. Um, so you guys remember to come back at 9 a.m. tomorrow. We're going to discuss meteorology. So Riley's going to teach at 9 a.m. tomorrow. And then I'm going to show y'all another really fun activity at the 11 a.m. that you can do really fun experiments with. So if we don't have any more questions or really fun comments, then we will say goodbye. And I don't see any. So I'll see you guys in the morning.